Tonight we're going to start our message um, by reading our scripture passage. So there's bookmarks in the Bibles. If you would turn to 955, we're going to read Luke 6. I'll give you a minute to turn there. Luke 6, we're going to start with verse 12. And I think it's on the right-hand side. Rick, do you want to check the door, please? Check to see what Somebody's there. Oh, um, yeah. That's fitting. Verse 12 is about the 12 apostles. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, what we're going to do is uh, read starting with verse 12. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray. He is Jesus here. He went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12. And he named them apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And you're right, Bill. We are going to be talking about the disciples. Um, tonight, and for the next several weeks, for the rest of Lent, we're going to focus on the disciples. There were 12 of them. There's a lot to say about them. So, and I think it's important to, to talk about them because they were such a crucial part of Jesus' ministry. They took a lot of his time while he was here. And they also, well, in all honesty, without them, I don't think that we would have the church that we have today. I mean, they carried on the work of our Lord. So first of all, I want to talk about what a disciple is. And the dictionary says, you knew I was going to look it up. Disciple is a follower or a student of a teacher, leader, or philosopher. Now that's today's definition. And I think that's a pretty accurate description of what a disciple was in Jesus' time. Now, disciples would typically pick their teacher just like we pick the college we're going to go to. We don't follow one person in our education. We go to a school and pursue a degree and things. And I don't know what made them choose who they would pick. Did they find somebody who was charismatic and they just liked them and followed them because of that? Did they go because maybe family was putting pressure on them? You know, we like our kids to go to the same college we went to kind of a thing. Was it... They just liked what the person had to say. I don't know what drove them to pick the teacher that they followed, but they chose the teacher. And what's interesting is that Jesus' disciples didn't pick Jesus. Jesus picked them. And so right out of the starting block, this is in, an unusual relationship. Jesus, um, Jesus, picked them, and again, we don't know why he picked them. We don't know why God picks us. I mean, we just don't understand those things. But when I was thinking about this, and I know it's March Madness, and I know nothing about basketball because I hate squeaky shoes, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you guys will be able to help me out here. You know, these colleges, they, they want good teams. And if they're in the top, they want to stay there. And so they scout, and they look, and they... And they put a lot of energy and a lot of time into recruiting people to be in their college and to be on their team so they can stay at the top. And you know, I thought about it, and that's how God is with us. Just like Jesus chose the disciples, God is pursuing each one of us. We like to think sometimes that, oh, he only picks a few. But the Bible tells us he doesn't want any to perish. He wants all of us, so he's pursuing all of us. And the question is, are we responding to that pursuit? And it just, it blessed my heart to think that we have a God that is looking for us and not just waiting for us to happen upon him. And that's what happened with the disciples. They, um, they, were, they were called by Jesus. They didn't go, oh, there's this new teacher in town, and maybe we should go follow him. He approached them. Now, during the Roman Empire, most 
the average age for an adult male, and we all know what average means, there's a lot above and below, but the average age for an adult male was about 30. And so I need you to erase your brains <laughs> because I know that it, what's inside of your brains is the same thing that's inside of mine. All those pictures, you know, The Last Supper, you know, all the, all the Michelangelo and, and Da Vinci things. And they were old men in those pictures. I'm sorry the disciples didn't have gray beards. I think some of them were lucky to have a beard. <laughs> they were teenagers. And we've learned before that in the Jewish culture, between the age of five and about 12 or 13 was when they got their spiritual training. And when they were done at 12 or 13, that is when they would find a rabbi or a teacher to follow. So somewhere between 12 and 15, they were in that pursuit. So we figure that the disciples were probably in that age, mid-teens. Now we know that Peter was a little older because he was married. But he was probably, you know, maybe 18. And the reason we know he was married is we know about his mother-in-law. That's recorded in Matthew. And it's also believed that his wife was part of the disciples that followed um, Christ around. And we know that there were women that traveled with him. So besides the, the whole age conception that we have, when you read the Gospels now, I want you to rethink that these were young men. They didn't have a lot of life experience. And they probably had some maturity issues sometimes. And I think we might understand them a little differently when we read some of the things that they say and do. And we'll learn more um, about that as we go through this, this series. So who were they? We know that they were observant Jews. They, they had been trained in their faith, and, or they wouldn't have been willing to follow you know, a new teacher. And we also know that they had a mishmash of occupations. Some of them were fishermen. We know we had a tax collector in there. There were a bunch of different occupations. So they came from different walks of life, different attitudes, different opinions on things. Some of them were friends of each other. Some of them were related. They were brothers. There's a cousin in there. And so it was quite a, a group of people. Some of them had actually chosen John the Baptist as their teacher. And when they got to know Jesus and they were called by him, they left John the Baptist and followed Christ. So there's uh, quite, a, quite a variety in, in the 12. And I'm, a, I'm one of those people that learns best with audio and visual. And so I actually have a map tonight to kind of show you where, um, where they, they came from and, and the land. And just so that you understand a little better, if we look at Israel like it's the state of Wisconsin, the star <laughs> in the middle is where Jerusalem was. That was the hub of everything. It would have been like a capital. And Jerusalem is where, you know, they went for the feasts and where they found Jesus in the temple and, and later on Jesus would be crucified. There are a lot of things happen in Jerusalem. But if you look at the top, um, the red circle is Nazareth. And that's where Jesus grew up. He was called a Nazarene because he grew up in Nazareth. And um, across that lake there, there's a blue circle. And that is where the fishermen came from. So they were all Galilean. You see that area is Galilee. And so they were all Galileans. And the Bible talks about that, kind of like we're from Wood County. Mm -hmm. And so people look at us differently than if we were from Milwaukee County. And it was the same there. So they were all from that part. There's a green line between the two lakes, and that's the Jordan River. And so there's times in the New Testament that we read about things happening in the Jordan River. So it was somewhere along there. They don't tell us exactly where. Sometimes they give us a city, but not, not very often. And then the last thing you'll see is a yellow arrow. And that is um, the city that he came from isn't on this map. But that's where they believe Judas Iscariot came from. And I don't know where all the disciples came from, but it seems like most of them came from Jesus' neck of the woods. 
So it's kind of interesting that Judas, of all people, came from a whole other part of, uh, of the, the country. And you can see in there, there's Samaria and all those things. And I would encourage you, if you have maps in the back of your Bible, use them when you're reading. It just makes the Bible come alive so much better and so much more. Now, another interesting thing about Jesus' disciples is that they didn't follow the Torah. They followed Jesus. Most of the teachers in that day taught from the Torah. That was their Bible. It was very short compared to what we have because it hadn't all been written yet. And there were many ideas as far as what that meant. And they had certainly, some of the sects had added lots of new rules because there weren't enough to start with. <laughs> and, and so there were all of these different teachings. You, and the Bible talks to us about the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Zealots and all of those kinds of things. There were, I think, two more, but I can't think of what they were off the top of my head. And so that's what they taught. They took the Torah and they put their twist on it. The disciples didn't follow the Torah. Jesus didn't teach the Torah. They followed Jesus. And Jesus was the truth. Jesus was the light. Jesus was, you know, living water, all of those things. So they followed him. And he quoted scripture a lot a lot in his life but he explained it in a way that was so radical to what people were were hearing that you know it had to it couldn't be pleasant having been one of his disciples i mean they probably thought that the, this group was a bunch of lunatics because they were not traditional in their teachings um next week we're going to talk about the apostles that were opposites. And the best way that I can describe that would be to take Nancy Pelosi and a handful of her closest, strongest Democratic colleagues, and then take the president. And the same thing with the Republicans, just get some of this and put them all in a room together. And you get the picture. We're going to talk about the disciples that were polar opposites and, uh, and learn about them. The week after that, we're going to talk about the fishermen because that was probably the most common occupation. About a third or more of the disciples were fishermen. And then the last week, we're going to talk about the obscure disciples, because there's some that we just don't know a lot about, but, but we need to, to find out what we do know and talk about them. And, you know, most of us fall into that obscure category, so we may have the most to learn from them. Now, the, the handout that you have, I didn't grab one, on the back side of your handout, there's a list of the disciples. And there, there's two columns, and the right column are the other names that they were known by. And I probably didn't get them all, but I tried to get most of them. And you might want to keep this and stick it in the cover of your Bible. It, because when you're reading, you aren't always sure who they're talking about. And because they, they switch names up, and sometimes they use a first name, and sometimes they use a last name, and you know, there's two Jameses, and there's two Judases, and who are all these people? And it might help you when you're reading to understand who... Um, you know, who they're, they're actually talking about. Now, there's one more thing that I want to talk about tonight before we go into table talk. And that is the call of the disciples. And for years, I was confused when I read the Gospels. First, they get called when Jesus is baptized. Then they get called out of the fishing boat. And, you know, couldn't, couldn't these... Gospels keep it straight. It was very confusing to me. And as I studied and, and learned more about it, I, I realized that these were different stages in their callings and that God called them multiple times to different things. And so that's what I want to spend the rest of, uh, of tonight talking about. And the first, conver the, the first phase of the call was what I'm going to call the conversion. Um, they had to believe that Jesus was the Christ. And it's the first stage for us, too, is to acknowledge God 
and to believe that he's God and that we need a God. And some people will say you need a born-again experience. Some say it's salvation. Some talk about a sinner's prayer. There's all these different phrases. But we all have a, to have that point in our lives when we come to know Jesus. And that was the first step for the disciples. And, and you can find that call in 1 John. I think that's referenced on your sheet. Next, if we go to Luke 5, we find what I'm going to label the call to service. And everybody doesn't answer this call, but I think we're all called to service. And it doesn't mean that you have to go to Bible college and seminary and all of those kinds of things to serve God. It means serving within your church, serving within your family and your life. It's a desire to, to be Christ-like and to do things that he would have done or, or he's asking you to do. And that story, and you're, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, it's the, um, the disciples have been fishing all night. They come back with empty boats. Jesus tells them to throw the net in the craziest place in the lake, and then they have more fish than they know what to do with, and he tells them, now I'm going to make you fishers of men. So that was the call to service. There was more than just following him. And that is when they left their jobs. Because, see, they were still fishermen. They were following Jesus, but they hadn't given up their day jobs. And at this point, they were willing to start sacrificing for him. And most of us should reach that point in our lives as well, that we're willing to sacrifice for our Lord. Then, if we move into the verse that we read tonight in Luke 6, that was when Jesus chooses them. If, if you read that closely, there were a lot of disciples, and Jesus pulled 12 out of those disciples. And so they were special. They were chosen to do something different. And he calls them apostles at that point. And so that was when they really got into the nitty-gritty of their study. And they're following him everywhere. And he takes them aside many times just by themselves, not with all the other disciples, not with the crowds of thousands. And he has the, this, you know, intimate time with them to teach them. And what I find most interesting is the last call, which is when he commissions them. And I think it's, it's <coughs> dear to my heart because when I was called into ministry, I didn't know what I would be doing. I just knew it would be different. And here we are. <laughs> and the, the nice thing about that is to realize that they didn't know what they were doing either. They followed Jesus blindly. And they took in the things that he had to teach them. They did the on-the-job training and went out to cast out demons and found out they weren't as good as they thought they would be and, and things. And, and they went through a pretty grueling um, training process. But it wasn't until Jesus had died, had risen from the grave, had appeared before at least hundreds, if not more, and then... He's getting ready to ascend into heaven, and then he tells them what their call is, what it's all about, and he commissions them. And he says, you need to take everything that you've seen and heard and that I've taught you, and you need to take it into the whole world. And they needed to start in Jerusalem in their own home, but that was what they were commissioned to do. And without those 12 crazy individuals, I don't think that we would be here today. So Jesus commissioned them at the end of all of their training and things. So, and, and I can't tell you the number of times I have had conversations with people. What does God want me to do? Where am I supposed to be? Where am, what am I supposed to do? Just be patient. That's all I can say is be patient. And it isn't easy for most of us. We want to know, and we want to roll up our sleeves, and we want to do but God knows best. And so that is really the last thing that I have to say about the call from God is to be patient as he works through us and with us to make us the people that he wants us to be and tells us exactly where he wants us to go.